We're launching into a new sermon series this morning called By Design. The subtitle is God's Design for Sexuality, for Singleness, and for Marriage. And our heart in this series is, there's a lot of things at play here, but really our, our real heart's passion is that we want to, uh, by God's grace, we want to be able to give some clarity where there might be confusion. Uh, we want to be able to give some comfort where there may be pain. And uh, we also want to give, um, I want to give counsel where there might be concern. And with that, uh, we're going to offer you a, a, an email address that you can send questions to. It's pr- um, questions at perimeter.org. And this is not so much for a Q&A that we'll do from the stage, but this is uh, opportunities for you as we work our way through this series to be able to submit questions and even say, hey, I would, I would love for someone to follow up with me and meet with me in person as I, as I kind of walk through this and listen to what's uh, being taught on Sunday morning. So just know that that's an outlet for you. I would also say this. As we make points during this series, there may be some things that we say that you really resonate with such that you feel that you need to applaud. Or we may make some points that resonate with you such that you feel that you need to do the opposite of applaud, whatever that is for you. And I would encourage you to not do either one. This is an incredibly delicate sermon series. Today is just, uh, and I don't want to say just because it's less than, but today is an overview introduction that Caleb will give. But as we get into the coming weeks, we'll be getting a little bit deeper into some of these very touchy topics and many of these that are hitting very close to home for many of you. And so with that, I just want us to be very temperate. The Bible says a lot about temperance, about having a posture of temperance. And so let's be that. Let's be the, those who are even engaging in this sermon series in a very temperate way. We're going to support this series. Uh, I mentioned this last week. We're going to support it by not just what we teach on Sunday mornings, but uh, get into the weeds a little bit more in some of the podcasts that we're recording. Um, I've already recorded a couple of those, and uh, we'll be doing some more with some outside guests that really come in with expertise in some of these areas. One of those guests we have a unique opportunity with, her name is Nancy Piercy. And uh, Nancy Piercy is a truly world-renowned, often even labeled and considered as uh, one of the leading, if not the leading, female experts in Christian worldview and sexuality. Let me just close with this. You'll see, as in all of our teaching series, but I want to remind you in this one, uh, our authority, we believe with all of our hearts that our authority is certainly God through his word, that God's word is is the authority that we sit under and that we are taught by. And so with that, uh, prepare your hearts now for the reading of God's word from Genesis chapter three as Caleb comes. Good morning, Perimeter Church. Our scripture reading today comes from Genesis chapter three, verses one to seven. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us that we may, in such a way, hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, 
we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Gracious Father, we ask, would you take our anxious hearts and would you enfold them in your steadfast one? Would you show us Jesus in all his beauty and his glory and his goodness? And would we hear, even from this text, Lord, where so many things seem to go wrong, would we hear your gracious invitation to come home? Would you do this in the precious name of your son? Amen. This summer has meant for the Click family a bunch of things. It's meant beach trips, uh, travel for work and for school, and a whole host of other things. But for me as a nerd, it has also meant this is the season when I read all of my candy books. The silly science fiction and, and other things that maybe ordinarily I would go, I don't have time for that because there's so much else to do. And this summer, one of the best books that I read was this history book. Not exactly what you think of as a candy read, but it reads beautifully. This history book called Facing the Mountain by Daniel James Brown. It tells the true story of Japanese American patriots during World War II. These men and women who experienced extreme injustice but also showed resiliency and patriotism and a love for their country that is honestly kind of startling to behold. And one of the threads that is told in this story is the story of a unit in the United States Army that I'd never heard of, the 442nd. The 442nd was a segregated unit in the United States Army composed completely of Japanese Americans. It served in the southern France and in northern Italy. And this is something that I didn't know. It is the most decorated combat unit in all of United States military history for its size and length of service. Out of 1,800 men, 0.11% of the United States military, they possessed 21 Congressional Medals of Honor. 4.4% of all of those given out in the entire war. They died by the hundreds. And one of the things that struck me in the story, in the book, was that these men, these men who served with such distinction, these men who were so loyal and faithful to their country, who fought with such bravery, they loathed the general who commanded them. They hated him. And the reason was simply this. In their eyes, the general treated them like cannon fodder. He either did not know what he was doing or he did not care about them at all. He would undermine the orders of his subordinates. He would ignore their recommendations. He would reject the reports of military intelligence. And time and time again, he would send the 442nd straight into the mouth of the beast over and over and over again, wherever the point of attack was supposed to go, they became the end of the spear and hundreds upon hundreds of them died, sometimes fruitlessly, because he just kept sending them. And military scholars think that the reason this group became the most decorated in, military, in United States military history, it was literally because this general kept putting them in such awful positions. It got so bad that one of the officers... When he heard that the general was on the radio and had an order to give, he literally yanked the wire out of the field radio because he knew that if he heard that order, he had to obey it. And whatever was coming, based on his experience, it would either be disastrous, it would be disastrous and possibly suicidal. His commands were commands that they did not trust because he didn't know what he was doing or maybe worse still, he didn't care about them at all. And so when that general's word would come, they bristled. As I was preparing for this sermon, it struck me that the way the men of the 442nd viewed that general, that's often the way that we view God. We hear his commands. We open up his word. And we all, as fallen human beings, we experience these points of tension. 
These places where what God calls us to, it clashes with our own sensibilities. These, these calls and commands that we don't understand and feel like us, like someone is calling us to walk into death. And we find ourselves wondering the same thing the men of the 442nd did. Does God know what he is doing? And does he care for us at all? All of us face those questions. But nowhere does that point of tension perhaps make itself felt more acutely than when it comes to the issue of sex and sexuality. I mean, to our modern ears, not just in the world outside, but even right here in the church, the word of God, it sounds like something alien and incomprehensible. I mean, it drops into our world and it explodes our assumptions about who we are and where life is found. And you can hear it in the kind of questions that we're asking. If God loved me and he cared for me and sex is this beautiful and good thing, why would he restrict who I can have it with and when? If God so loved me, so cared for me and so wanted my happiness, why would he want me to stay in a marriage that maybe is unhappy and where I don't feel fulfilled? If God so loved me and cared for me and I feel a certain way and I desire a certain thing, why might he possibly call me to live in a way that is not in accordance with those desires and those feelings? And over and over and over again, we find ourselves running up against God's word and finding it calling us to something that doesn't feel like life and that often feels like death. And the world around us is saying the Christian sexual ethic, it is something that is either be adapted or abandoned. It is repressive and regressive, it is harmful, it diminishes our humanity and it strips us of our joy. And what I would contend to you this morning is that feeling, that tension, that struggle, it's not new. This is not a modern issue, this is a human issue. When you look across the history of mankind and especially the history of the church, across denominations and across cultures, you'll notice that there is a remarkable consistency in terms of what we have thought the Bible taught about human sexuality. Doesn't matter where you go in history, the vast majority of the church across time has had this core sense of here is the foundation upon which we are to build. And it's a foundation that's laid right here in Genesis one to two, right before the text we just heard read. God creates humanity Male and female, he makes them, enshrining sexual bodily distinction into the goodness of his creation. He creates marriage, this one flesh union between a man and a woman, sexually distinct complements that is to be exclusive and permanent. He creates sex, this gift of God to be embraced that is a means of expressing the intimacy of that one flesh union, but not only that, is intended for the purpose of having children, so that we would be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth as God commands us in Genesis one and two. God, God gives his yes to our sexual distinction. He gives his yes to marriage. He gives his yes to sex. But with those yeses, he also gives these very strong and definitive no's. And it's right there, it's right there that we feel the tension, isn't it? And as remarkably consistent as the church has been in its understanding of the Bible's teaching, so too has the church in the world outside been consistent in its struggle with that teaching. I mean, all you have to do is flip through the Bible. Read through the story of the people of the Old Testament just for a moment. Do you see people who are delighting in God's vision for human sexuality? The answer is pretty quickly, no. There's polygamy, adultery, prostitution, rape. You turn to the New Testament. Jesus unfolds in Matthew 19, God's vision for marriage, and one of the disciples, his disciples, the 12 say, they're so dismayed by what Jesus says, they say maybe it's better not even to get married at all. Look at the concerns of the churches and the letters that make up the back half of the New Testament and what are so many of them surrounding our bodies, marriage, and sex. 
It doesn't matter where you go in human history, when the word of God is dropped in, there are these points of tension specifically on the issue of sex. These places where we hear the word and we go, that just doesn't seem to make sense. These places where we're going, God, I don't know if I can trust you here. And I want to be clear this morning what my goal is. My goal is not to make the case for you as to what the Christian sexual ethic is. That is something that Jeff and Bob and Jimmy are going to lay out in the weeks to come. My goal this morning is one thing. It's to tell you why. Why, as personal and as hard as this is, why we should want to hear that vision. Not as something repressive and regressive and harmful, but as good news. Because the God, the God we see in Jesus, he is a God who is so good, so kind, so loving, that we can not only hear him but obey him even when we don't understand because we know that he would intend nothing for us except what is for our good. If we're gonna do that, that means we first have to recognize that so much of this struggle, it goes back to something that's very, very old. To this lie of the serpent, whispered in the garden all the way back in Genesis 3. Satan takes this command, a command that probably made as little sense to Adam and Eve as God's vision for sexuality makes to us today. And Satan uses it to drive a wedge between man and God by making it the filter through which they understand God's character. And we have to remember what's just happened. In Genesis 1 to 2, God creates the heavens and the earth. He forms and he fills the cosmos with life. He declares all of it very good. He he makes humanity in his image. He gives us a special status and a special calling. He creates, in Genesis 2, a special home, a garden. God becomes a gardener and he plants something. And he places man and woman in the very midst of it to work and to keep it, to live in it and abide in it, to spread his rule and reign across the earth. And he provides for them everything that they would need. Everything they require is there. They have fellowship with him, fellowship with each other, food, drink, life, everything. And it is in the context of God's overflowing goodness that God then gives this very specific but also really weird command. Genesis 2 Verse 16 to 17. And the Lord God commanded the man. Hear that. That means everything that follows is part of the command, not just certain pieces of what follows. Saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, and here's the strange part, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you die, or the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, here's my question. You hear those two verses. What's the one piece that immediately stands out in your mind? It's the one thing that God says we can't have. The negative. But I want you to ask this. Was there one command in here or two? There's two. The second command is a negative one. The second command says there is this one tree that you are not to partake of, that you are not to eat. But the first command, the primary command, it's overwhelmingly positive. You shall surely eat. It's the language of intensification of every tree of the garden. Here's what God's saying. He's saying, my heart, my desire is so to bless you, 
I so want your good and your blessing and your life. I'm not just giving you the trees in the garden. I'm commanding you to feast upon the trees in the garden. I want you to know my bounty and my love and my goodness. I want you to experience it to the core of your being. I care for you. And you may hear that and go, well, then why the one negation? Why give all of that and just have this one little piece where God says, yeah, but not this. It'd be like me giving you an infinite sum of money and saying, spend it on whatever you want, and then saying, oh, and by the way, I want you to put one dollar on the ground and just leave it there. It's odd. But here's what I think is happening. The context of this command, it's not legal first. It's relational. And what is at the heart of every good relationship? Trust. In giving them a command that they do not understand, a command that sounds strange and weird. I mean, think about all the other commands he could have given. Don't murder, that makes sense. Don't hurt other people, that makes sense. Don't steal, that makes sense. But don't eat of a tree? God is saying, I'm inviting you to trust me even when you don't understand me. He's saying, he's inviting them to say, because you have so loved us, out of love for you, we will not only trust you, we will obey you because we know who you are. A good father who gives good gifts to your children and thus gives good commands. And it is right here, it's right here that the serpent shows up and begins to pour this acid on this trust by going after the one thing upon which it's built, the character of God. Open up chapter three and notice how the entire conversation gets framed. There's no mention of God's goodness. There's no mention of his provision. There's no mention of his generosity and of his bounty. The infinite sum that has just been given to them and handed to them and they've been told to enjoy, it's nowhere. Where is all of the serpent's focus? Restriction. He starts in verse one with what is just a blatant lie. Verse one. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of, and notice this, any tree in the garden? He says, did God put you in the garden to starve you? What kind of a God would put you in the garden and then let you see all this food and say, you can't have any of it? And Eve, Eve is smart enough to go, okay, well, this, that doesn't seem quite right. And she, she pushes back, which you have to give her credit for, but the way she pushes back tells you that something is already wrong. Look at what she says, verse two. We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. The serpent in that moment has to be smiling because did you notice what happened? Did Eve seem to think there was two commands or one? One, we may eat of the trees in the garden, but who is God? God said, you shall not eat of the one. Who is God in her summation? God is someone who restricts us. And notice this, the restriction that is given, she's made it bigger than it actually was. It doesn't just say, you can't eat it. She says the command of God was we weren't to touch it. Something God never said. And the serpent, the serpent just drills in. He says in verse four and five, you won't surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you you will be like God. That sounds good, doesn't it? Knowing good and knowing evil. Satan says, why, why would you trust the Lord? One, he's lying to you. This thing he says will kill you, it won't kill you. And two, 
The thing he says will kill you, actually, it will give you life. And guess what? God knows it. And he doesn't want you to have it. He's not a good father who gives good gifts. He is a miser and a tyrant who strips you of the best ones. He's a God who takes and takes and takes and offers you absolutely nothing in return. And through the one tree of restriction, the serpent, the serpent removes the picture of the forest of God's generosity. It'd be like taking my hand and putting it in my face. I can just see my hand now, even though you are much bigger. Everything is obscured because of the one thing brought close. And Adam and Eve, because Adam's there too, according to the text, saying nothing. Adam and Eve buy it. Romans 1 says they exchange the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And what should frighten us is they're not alone in doing that, are they? I mean, think just for a moment about those moments when you have found God's word speaking into your life in a way that makes you uncomfortable, calling you to things that maybe feel like death. What's the argument that begins to play in your head? If God loved me, he would want me to be happy, wouldn't he? If God loved me, he wouldn't want me to have to inhibit my freedom, would he? If God loved me, he wouldn't keep me from the thing that I most desire. He would give that to me and he would give it to me in full. And I want you to hear it. It is the echo of the argument of the serpent in Genesis 3. It is us over and over and over again coming back to that decision about who will we trust, the Lord or us. And this is key. It isn't just the one who rejects God's word who does this. It's also many of us who claim to believe God's word who do this. Because the legalist who outwardly obeys, why do they obey? It's not because they know to the depths of their being the free and unrestricted love of God. It's not because they trust that he wants their good and he delights in them. Why does the legalist obey? Because they're afraid of what God will do to them if they don't. The love of God in the eye of the legalist, it's not something freely given. It's something you have to earn, which means they view the law the exact same way the person who rejects it does. It's not a path to life, it's a burden. It is something that you have to do or God, he is going to get you. And the place you see it is this. It shows itself when you find yourself restricting in your mind and in your heart who God could love and how he might love them. You see it in the older brother in Luke 15, don't you? The younger brother's gone off. He squandered all the father's money. He's wasted his inheritance. He's sinned against the father. He has brought their family name into shame. And when he comes home, the father welcomes him. And the older brother, he's what? He's angry. Because in his mind, love is something that you have to earn. How dare the father give it so freely? If obedience is the prerequisite for love, then no one who has not been obedient should be loved. That's the legalist. And I want you to notice this, the rebel and the legalist, they're just two branches of the same rotten, poisonous tree. They are two expressions of the same lie whispered by the serpent that God, he is not good, he does not love me. He takes and he takes and he takes and he takes and he gives nothing in return. And the gospel says there is only one antidote for both of those problems, and it's this. It's not, despite what we may think, it's not coming to an understanding of why God gives the command, though that matters. 
We should want to wrestle with these things. We should want to know the answers to these things. But there is one thing that matters more than any of those, and it is this. Who is the one who gives the law? It's the one we see in Jesus. The truth about God that the serpent obscured, that's the truth we now see in the face of Jesus Christ. And you see it. You see it even in Genesis chapter three. Adam and Eve exchange the truth about God for a lie. They spit in the face of God's trust by refusing to trust him. And how does God respond? Have you ever looked over this part of the story? He doesn't come shouting with fury. He doesn't start burning down all the other trees and saying, well, you ate the one, now you lose the others. He doesn't begin to rain down upon their heads condemnations. Instead, it says in verse eight that God walks in the garden in the cool of the day. He comes quietly, not shouting, but with questions. And when he begins to lay out the consequences of our sin, which they're real, that there is a spiritual death that has just taken place, a separation that now exists between man and God, and that physical death, it is now a part of God's world, and this broken creation marred by the fall, at the very same time, God, he gives this promise of redemption. Verse 15, Though God has been sinned against, God says, I'm going to save the sinner by sending one born of a woman who will bear the consequence in his own body and who will crush the serpent's head and with his head the serpent's lie. And before he sends them out of the garden, away from his presence east of Eden, God does one thing more and it is my favorite part of the whole story. He takes Adam and Eve who because of sin now know that they are naked and feel shame. And God does what? Verse 21, he clothes them with animal skins, which means someone had to die, but not Adam and Eve. It's his goodness. And where... Where do we now see that goodness in full? In the face of Jesus. In 1 John 4, John the Apostle writes, God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. In this, we see that love that the serpent obscured, we see it clearly. That God sent his only son into the world, that promised offspring of the woman who would crush the serpent's head and with his head the lie, so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, because we haven't, but that he, he loved us. And even as he created us in love, he has now redeemed us in love and sent his son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. In just over two verses, the reality of Jesus demolishes the serpent's argument. Because what does it say God wants for us? Not death, not a joyless existence where we live in despair. He sent his son, why? that we might live through him. He wants to bring us back into the presence of the one for whom we were made and who is our exceeding joy. And what is the father willing to give that he would have you once more? Not a tree, but his son. For you, for me, you know, we, we wonder if God's good. We wonder if he loves us. First John 4 says, you want to know who God is? You want proof that he's not like the general who doesn't know what he's doing or possibly care for the men in his command? 
All you have to do is look at Jesus. There is the love of God made manifest. God is love. Not just that he possesses love, he is love in his very being, which means there is nothing that he does, nothing that he gives that is not also loving. You know, that, that's the truth that turned Rachel Gilson's life upside down. You know, this summer, prepping for this sermon series, we've all been reading all sorts of books on this subject, and one, one of the most, I would say, helpful books that I read was one called Born Again This Way by a woman named Rachel Gilson. And in that book, she shares the story of her conversion to Christ. Uh, when she came to Yale University in the early 2000s, she was a lesbian atheist who was in love with her girlfriend and who was convinced that she was gonna marry her. When she heard about the Christian faith, she'd grown up in a non-religious household. When she heard it, it sounded to her intellectually feeble. It sounded as though it had no substance. And not only that, when she heard it, she heard it as giving a clear and nonsensical no to the love that she and her girlfriend shared. And so in her mind, Christianity wasn't even an option on the table. But then, at Yale University, of all places, God did something strange. She went into philosophy classes and suddenly began to realize that her arguments against God's existence, they weren't actually very strong. And as she began to realize that that faith she thought was feeble was actually strong, she also found herself returning again and again to the writings about Jesus. And it was right there with the person of Jesus. It was right there that she began to find her life, her perfectly planned future unraveling. Because when she looked at the face of Jesus, it unraveled the serpent's lie. She didn't see an ogre. She didn't see a tyrant. She didn't see a God who takes and takes and takes. She saw one instead who so loved her and so loved us that he left the glories of heaven for the dust of earth. She saw one who was willing to endure in his body the consequences that our sin deserved and who offered to clothe us not with the skins of animal but with his own righteousness, his perfection, and who gave it to us not as something to earn but as a gift. She saw one who came to seek and to save lost people just like her. And she said, at the sight of Jesus, the son of the gospel evaporated my atheism in an instant. And though her same-sex attraction didn't leave, and she still struggled to understand God's commands about sex, she knew she couldn't believe the lie anymore because she'd seen God in Christ. She wrote this, I was free to obey before I understood because of who Jesus is and who he had shown himself to be for me. Anything he said to me was for my good, even if I couldn't make out how. I could build my life on his goodness and love. I could echo the words of the disciple Peter, uttered as dozens of erstwhile followers abandoned Jesus because his teaching was so hard that in this man I had come to believe and know the Holy One of God. He alone had the words of life, and that, that was enough, even with my remaining questions. There is not a person in this room who doesn't have questions. There's not a person in this room who does not hear the call of the gospel and experience in it a cross. And we struggle and we don't always know what to do. And the scripture says there are answers to those questions, but it gives us one more than anything else. It grounds us in the God of such goodness and love that in the face of our sin and rebellion, he would give the most precious thing he possessed, Christ Jesus our Lord. You want to know who God is? You look at the face of Jesus. And what do you see? You can't say it's somebody who doesn't care about you. 
His nail-scarred hands say he cares about you more than you care for yourself. You can't say he doesn't love you because he shows his love for you in this and that while you were still a sinner, he died for you. We see in the face of Jesus a good father who gives good gifts, even the son, so that we would not, we would not actually perish, but we would have instead everlasting life. The question for us is simply this. Having seen that goodness, can we trust him even where we struggle to understand? Gracious Father, we are so thankful that we have a God like you. Lord, who so loves sinful people that you would send your son to die in our place, but Lord, you would also send your spirit so that we would receive adoption as sons and daughters. And we pray, Lord, would you take the veil that is over our eyes, would you take those places where the sin of Adam and Eve that we are all living under, Lord, where it is obscure the truth about yourself, Lord, would you remove it? Would you give us eyes to see you in all of your beauty and in your goodness? And Lord, in the face of that goodness, to so desire you that we would willingly, joyfully, with gladness leave everything else behind because we have found in you the one for whom we were made and who loves us in full. Would you do this in Jesus' name? Amen. You've been listening to the Perimeter Church Sermon Podcast. Perimeter Church is located at the corner of Highway 141 and Old Alabama Road in Johns Creek, Georgia. Please visit our website at www.perimeter.org for more information and to find other sermons from our teaching team. Thanks for making this podcast a part of your day.